Hello, and welcome to the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, California. We acknowledge that the land we are located on was once called Tovangar and is the unceded territory of the Keech, Gabrielino Tongve, and Fernandinho Tatavian peoples. We pay our respects to these communities and express gratitude for their stewardship, recognizing that they are the traditional caretakers of the land we now occupy. Crafting a meaningful land acknowledgement requires time, and we acknowledge that we have a lot to learn as we consider this land and the confluence of legacies that bring us here. My name is Irene George Atsatsos. I am the Director of Exhibition Programs and Chief Curator here at the Armory Center for the Arts, and I am very happy to be um, welcoming you to this conversation that we are here for today between artists Dina Abdul Karim and Hugo Hopping, moderated by the artist Harry Gamboa Jr. The inspiration for this talk came from some of the key themes of the 2019 exhibition by the Winter Office at the Armory, including the production of what the Winter Office calls non-perfect models of adaptation to ever-shifting, always contested environmental conditions. Using the exhibition as a point of departure, this dynamic conversation looks at the evolving Los Angeles urban landscape against the dissolution of public space, the exclusive architecture of privacy and housing inequities. Our first panelist, Dina Abdul Karim, PhD, is a Middle Eastern born American artist, architect, urban designer, and city planner. In her paintings, Abdul Karim combines patterns of arabesque motifs with aerial views of built structures to express the spiritual and everyday realities of these places and how they interact with or infuse each other to present individual experience as well as those that are social and cultural. In addition to maintaining a studio practice, Abdul Karim is Associate Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, California. Her teaching and research explore the perceptive and evaluative attributes of public spaces and the creative interpretations of their meanings. She is interested in the ways the social and psychological dimensions of places impact people's sense of belonging and well being. In line with her focus on equity, diversity, and participatory social change, Dina Abdul Karim collaborates with community organizations on projects that use that, on projects that aim to use art and creative placekeeping as a tool for building livable and vibrant communities. Our second panelist, Hugo Hopping, is an American artist, writer, and curator from Los Angeles, currently based in Copenhagen, where his practice blends conceptual art, aesthetic, and design education and collaborative cultural production. Hopping has exhibited widely, both as an artist and curator, most recently in Manifesto 13, Les Parallels du Sud in Marseille, France. In addition to his artistic activity, he writes about art, architecture, and cultural history. Together with the Danish urban planner and architect Johanna Ferrer Guldager, he co-founded and directs the artistic design group called the Winter Office. Since 2010, the group has worked through blended artistic research projects that integrate art, architecture, and design to address social, urban, and ecological challenges. Moderating this talk is artist Harry Gamboa Jr., a photographer, director, author, and performance artist internationally recognized for his combination of activism and social critique. He was an organizer of the East LA walkouts of 1968 and a co-founder of the avant-garde collective OSCO, from, which was active from 1972 to 1987, and the international performance troupe Virtual Verite, active from 2005 to 2017. During the pandemic, Gamboa contributed to In Plain Sight, an artist project by Rafa Esparza and Casiles that fights migrant detection, detention and the culture of incarceration in a performance that appeared in the sky above Mesa Verde Ice Processing and Detention Center in Bakersfield, California. 
He was also commissioned by the Autry Museum to produce a series of photographs that document the presence and impact of COVID-19 across Los Angeles representing the anxiety, isolation, and vulnerability, along with the resilience and strength of Angelinos living in this new normal. Gamoa has received numerous awards for his work and has taught, lectured, and participated in panel discussions at various universities internationally. His work is in many museum collections, and he has exhibited his artwork around the world. Harry Gamboa, Junior is the co-director of and faculty in the program in photography and media at California Institute of the Arts in Valencia. I wanna thank all three of you. Um, you're all very busy. Um, it's really great to have you here and to circle back to the winter office exhibition um, in which all three of you played various roles. Uh, so I'm very happy to be a part of presenting this conversation. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Irene. And um, I think we, we would like to begin by maybe having uh, uh, both uh, Dina and Hugo in introduce uh, their kind of starting position in relation to the exhibition. And uh, maybe we'll have Hugo because uh, Dina actually uh, was invited by Hugo to participate. And so, uh, Hugo, if you don't mind uh, giving us sort of an overview. Uh, yeah, um, very happy to do so. Um, if I could see the slide of the introductory green slide of um, the uh, the exhibition, um, I going to start by uh, sort of uh, first uh, mentioning that uh, in around 2017, I approached um, uh, uh, Irene with uh, with the at that time, we were, as the winter office, we were trying to develop a, a, an, an, a precise, a very well-rounded study around the home of an LA artist named Raul Baltasar, uh, which he has this um, informal sort of residency slash uh, home uh, studio environment that uh, he has been making available for artists for over 10 years. And, and uh, we were actually wondering that, you know, it would be really great to really make like sort of a cross-sectional analysis that connects all of the things that he's interested with, with the actual urban plan in which is embedded is actually um, Echo Park, I believe. And uh, so we approached uh, uh, um, Irene to see if she would like to support the project, uh, not necessarily to have an exhibition at, uh, but to, to sort of have moral support in terms of a uh, 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 the, the various foundations we were approaching to actually make the project. Uh, keep in mind that we were, uh, 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 I was basically organizing the project from the perspective of coming from Copenhagen back to Los Angeles. So then um, uh, the funding for these projects were not, uh, they're not, were not successful as we wanted them to. So we scaled back the idea. And then uh, after uh, um, Irina, contacted is and building from from the idea uh, she suggested that uh, maybe we could actually begin uh, developing an exhibition that would uh, sort of like uh, scale and to uh, further themes connected uh, with uh, the way that the winter office is working with art and architecture so uh, we've had several exchanges for quite a while until uh, she came to visit us to Copenhagen and uh, and then also we began basically sort of laying down the conditions for that. Uh, miraculously, at the same time, we were being invited to do a residency uh, that I arranged uh, with uh, 18th Street Ar um, Art Center. So it created an opportunity to sort of introduce the idea that the two organizations could maybe mutually support the invitation to come to uh, Los Angeles. And actually sort of during the period of our residency, we will execute the exhibition at the Armory. And the, um, the uh, dynamic between uh, both organizations, both uh, directors and curators of the organizations uh, uh, was so delightful that it allowed us to basically put together like a really interesting sort of initiative in which we could basically reside for six months at 18th Street and then uh, commute to, Sa to, to Pasadena from Santa Monica and begin basically the process of mounting this uh, this exhibition uh, that we called Non-Perfect Dwelling. And the exhibition, uh, I, as both um, the director of the winter offices and as like the, the mainly the curator that's like driving 
the imagination as to like what kinds of things we developed for the for the projects that we wanted to work on. It was very important for us to like sort of try to find out if there was a way to apply non-ideal theory, which mainly comes from the law, um, uh, specifically people that are referring to uh, the creation of non-ideal institutions when ideal institutions fail us to correct some of society's most ardent problems, we were sort of thinking that this is actually a very interesting way to look at both the non-ideal, the non-perfect as a way to sort of like find very quick and remedial measures for what is actually a very complex uh, 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 sort of systemic problem that we have uh, where basically any ideal correction that's proposed for uh, ameliorating sort of say the climate crisis uh, may produce really terrible circumstances in other areas. So uh, it comes out of the idea that basically like uh, every system a, a correction may produce basically a mistake or an error in other systems. So this is uh, actually something that urban planners obsess about in terms of corrections. So for example, just in terms of traffic. And so we were just really thinking through uh, different problems of design and how to actually, how can we translate them to an overall sort of uh, exhibition philosophy that, that would allow us to basically pull in the best of social practice, the best of uh, conceptual art, the best of uh, sort of like deep ecology and, and, and other, factors that are basically influencing the production of space. And uh, well, uh, the result was this exhibition that which uh, had multiple elements in it, but actually in, in spirit, it reduced everything down to very sort of minimalistic installations. Uh, for example, it included a, a, a library that was actually, mm, actually a bookstore that uh, uh, were, we, we was in collaboration with uh, Romans in Pasadena that actually supplied like all the numbers of books that were connected to uh, different climate change titles or publications that were released in the last three years leading up to the exhibition. Uh, we had uh, numerous uh, structural changes done architecturally to the armory uh, to actually create the possibility for uh, actually creating a different sort of flow and walk and experience of the, of the exhibition. And while at the same time we had we kept on sort of showcasing like the different intricate collaborations that we made for the show. For example, we are the flags that you see hanging there. Those are basically flags that are, are painted on rice paper silk screens with, that were made by members of uh, the Extinction Rebellion and uh, Sunrise Movement. Uh, the LA chapter of both organizations. Uh, were invited to basically do uh, a special silk screen workshop uh, and have a discussion. And so this in all it was, a, was an effort to basically showcase how we are thinking about uh, these non-ideal approaches and create sort of a, a, a framework that can allow the work of art to help people interrogate uh, basically what is the philosophy of change or applied change going to look like in a, in a larger sort of context. Thank, thank you, Hugo. And, um, and Dina, maybe you can uh, introduce your uh, collaboration and participation. Um, and you are muted, Dina, please. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thank you, Hugo and Irene for the um, introduction. Yeah, I, um, I came to uh, learn about the winter office when actually I was, um, I approached 18th Street uh, for collaborating with them in my um, one of my uh, urban design studios, like I did mentioned. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually an associate professor in, in Cal Poly, and I teach urban design um, courses. And then I, because because Cal Poly is very focused on. Um, on learning by doing and getting a practical real experience. And this is specifically um, true for, for students who study planning. They come so that they learn how to go um, make an impact in their communities. So I thought I'm going to be, instead of just like these make believe projects, I have them, I like improvise and have them work on. I'm just going to go bring them communities that they, that's gonna resemble a lot of the communities they actually come from and were born and raised in. 
and have organizations, have them collaborate with organizations and on issues that, that the community cares about. And because I'm an artist, because I like uh, creative placemaking and urban design and creative placekeeping, I started looking for art organizations that do this. And one of the very early that came to my mind is 18th Street. And they said, yeah, that's a nice idea, but hold on a second. You're going to be intrigued by the work of the Winter Office. And this was actually started um, the dialogue with them. And then uh, um, Sarah and um, who else came, Hugo? My Johanna, friend? yeah. Johanna, yes. Um, uh, and who came to my studio and we talked about um, what it means to actually co-inhibit places in, in, in Europe, but also in, uh, in, in, the U in, in LA. And that's why I love LA. I came to LA to study, uh, to study art, but then I ended up for staying here for the planning because of how big and messy of a lab LA is. Um, it's very enriching because when I studied urban design, I really focused on environmental aesthetics, coherence and harmony and mystery and how to create a, a nice facade and how to create a lovely plaza and how to create a walkable street. And you come to LA and then you know that this is a lot more than that, right? It's not about that. It's all about the issues that the winter office brings in their exhibition, the houselessness and and the global warming and, 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 and issues of identity and that co-inhibiting co co places and all this that Hugo admitted was distilled to minimalism in their show that looks pristine and organized and very clean. And it's enticing, right? Because you step in it thinking, oh yeah, this looks pretty neat. And then every caption alone is like, and a topic that needs like a year of discussion or like it, it's, it's, it's a tough net to not to crack. You know, each, each one of these issues raised by, by the exhibition is, is, is um, merits attention by itself. So I think that this discussion could go into so many directions um, because again, that exhibition really distills all the, the problem, all the issues that gives me headache and keeps me up at night. And actually one of, um, um, I, w I was reading what that were one of your captions about, about the, the one, one of your uh, pieces in the show and you, and was intrigued by, by your use of houselessness. Because, and it's only, I mean, you know, like sometimes you read things and then you read them again and like, oh, that's really intriguing. Because two days ago, uh, my, my very young daughter, very young and innocent, she was saying, oh, I feel sorry for the poor because they, they don't have uh, families. And then the other daughter was like, oh no, the poor have families the poor, the, the homeless, because I feel sorry for the poor, I think, because they don't have families and homes. And then my other daughter started to, to teach her what it means to not have a house, but have a family. It means that you, if you're experiencing homelessness, you still have a family, you still have love, right? It's just a condition, like it's just a circumstance. And I feel like that is at, at a very, um, personal like human level we understand these but then they get very complicated very easily and with politics but but that houselessness is such a term that i think is is so true i wish we start we did start replacing that the, the homelessness uh, term so well um dina and hugo i think uh, i guess a unifying factor is sort of a all of us being in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area, either physically or psychologically connected to Los Angeles. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, um, uh, I had sort of the pleasure of actually attending your lecture at the Schindler House, uh, uh, along with members of the, uh, uh, the Winter Group, and, uh, and also have had the opportunity to traverse uh, 
the urban scape of Marseille and Copenhagen and Los Angeles with Hugo. And, uh, but one of the things that's evident when you come to Los Angeles is um, the multiplicity of cultures, uh, but this is always affected by the centrifugal social forces uh, that affect the parallax view of the various cultures, uh, finding it difficult to understand who is who, and just by observing causes some level of displacement. Um, and it's also uh, primarily a psychological displacement uh, complicated by the actual phys physical imperfections of what makes up Los Angeles, which has all been designed specifically to erase uh, the original inhabitants and the, and the original history, uh, all of it is, a, is based on obfuscation. And so um, uh, that, in, that in of itself generates sort of an entire environment that it's imperfect imperfection um, uh, piled on with continuous imperfection and which then gives us quite a bit to talk about. This, uh... This term, uh, uh, houselessness, or the houseless, or uh, is a, a, it's a very interesting term. I mean, there's a whole history behind why it shift from homeless. Uh, uh, primarily, um, it's been used for, for quite a while. I don't want to go into like citations, but the, what it, what the reason we found it inherently useful to basically begin adopting it is because it, it made it very clear that there was a psychology applied to the term uh, homelessness uh, or the homeless, meaning it's kind of the sort of say, mainly putting the blame on them as like, you know, affected subjects that could, that lost a home, a psychological space. And that houselessness you know, was basically a way to actually having lost a structure. And, then, and th this for us became a very important sort of way, uh, a formality to think through that basically um, that it connects it basically to one of like the major first crises that like that was developed in California quietly at the end of the 70s uh, as basically like climate science began to basically realize that we're going to begin warming up the world. It was also mental health. I mean, uh, when when uh, the uh, or Republican governor in the 70s decided to basically like put all the people that had mental health issues out from state welfare programs that were giving them a medical attention ended up creating basically the first like deep layer of, of uh, houselessness. And, and, uh, and now uh, today, uh, I mean, we have uh, all in LA, all of these uh, very deeply rooted um, encounters uh, that are problematic for um, any society between basically people that are suffering, you know, dense mental health issues and then their encounter, for example, with the police. So the, in that case, uh, um, there was no uh, ideal institution from say, you know, from state government coming up with another solution to be able to provide these services. But then at the same time, it, there, there, there wasn't even uh, a discussion for what would be the non-ideal solution uh, because basically um, grassroots and uh, uh, nonprofit organizations are just basically like, you know, they're at capacity. They've been at capacity for quite a while without actually having the chance to be able to go into and actually create uh, like a viable solutions that can sort of impact like say 20, 30 decades, you know, three or four decades into the future. So that's what's so incredible about Los Angeles is that for example, just you have this, 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 this houseless problem but you don't get a grip onto like how long is it gonna be in terms of its temporality? Is it like, is it gonna be a 10 year problem, 20 year problem? Or is it basically there to stay, but it's not allowed to basically really create an informal settlement, like say, in the way that you see, like say in Latin America. So, so it's uh, very interesting. So, so Hugo, this uh, you know we are in the Anthropocene uh, uh, era, uh, but some would kind of connect that also with the uh, introduction of the atomic age, and uh, Los Angeles in a way is sort of the atomic city, uh, cultural city, and um, uh, many of the experiments that uh, were directly connected to post-war uh, capitalism and the institution of, um, of whatever it is that would uh, emanate from uh, noir, uh, fictional noir, into actual environmental, cultural, and, art, and uh, 
uh, realistic noir uh, and combined and as actually maybe some of the, the major riots almost serve as though they're chapters in this overall book that has led us into the 21st century. Um, and, uh, and I think I was interested in maybe some of the projects you had, uh, uh, Dina, that I saw in your lecture about how there's, it could be imagined to maybe create these, uh, these interruptions in this chapter um, uh, and how do people respond to uh, functioning and creating objects or structures that might introduce options uh, for the general public or for just an individual to realize that uh, maybe houselessness um, can actually be overcome in a different manner? Well, um, I think that houselessness could come in a different manner, but, but the issue is not necessarily that we are lacking the thinking. It's not like what we, we, or we don't know what we do, but it's just that we probably don't want to know what we know how to do, right? It's, it's the will, it's, it's, it's not that we don't have the tools, it's just the hesitancy to apply them and then we keep making these excuses, really. It's, this is not the, I mean, aren't we like going to like conquering Mars? You think that maybe conquering Earth would be easier than conquering Mars. So like, why are we making a lot of, not we, but like the, pre, the project that is conquering Mars seems to be cracking this not a lot easier than cracking the issue of housing in LA, right? But I I like LA a lot because as much as 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 complicated things are in it, there is that cultural that diversity you were talking about, Harry, that makes probably the solution a little easier to grasp because I think it is a cultural issue where like um, and that's why the, you see that the accessory dwelling units have been have been um, um, admitted because there is a cultural acceptance for them and to them there wasn't so much uh, and it's nice because it's it's nice when there isn't a stigma around um, live the multi generational living right um, or or like culturally have a communal spacing that that LA allows for this type of alternative thinking about um, housing. Because as, as an immigrant, when I came here, I was really astounded by how this culture has probably more than like a, a hundred choices for the yogurt they eat, but then only one choice for where you live, right? I could only live in the suburb. That's it. Because the other alternative in Ohio, I mean, here you could you could choose to be urban in LA, but how many cities where you can choose to be urban? And not by actually, really, you, not even, you don't have the choice. You only have the choice to be urban if you are experiencing houselessness or if you're incredibly wealthy and can afford one of these lots, right? Otherwise, 90%, 95% of the choice is a suburban. So why is it that I can only choose one form of where I want to dwell, and then I have a hundred choices for yogurt, a hundred choices for cars, a hundred choices for everything else, super in unimportant. But then in my day-to-day -day experiences, I'm incredibly scripted, right? I can't go out to go like buy a bunch of parsley from around the corner store. I have to strap myself and strap my newborn to a car, to a car and then go and then get her car seat and all this because I just made the unforgivable mistake of like forgetting to buy the parsley, right? Where in, 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 in Jordan and in Syria, you know, my, I used to remember that my parents used to say, hey, Dina, we forgot this, can you go get it? Hey, Dina, my, my siblings, because they live, we all lived in one. We are craving shawarma. If you go get us one, we will buy you one on us too. Like, and, and then you go on, in and out. And, and if, you're, if you're feeling like really sad and, and, and the life is too tight, you go out to the, to the bakery or whatever. And then they tell you about their kid and they tell you about their this and they tell you, and then you realize that life is bigger than you are, right? 
and you understand that, oh, we're all in this together, or oh, we're all really co-inhibiting here, oh, they even them have problems, right? Like, right, and we feel close, and we feel our sense of culture, closeness, like you really get in the touch of humanity. But then here in, in our, in our disclosed living, also in the Middle East, to a great part, not only that so many of us are urban, but also the urban, the have and the have nots really co-share the place, go to the same park, right? The haves have probably a bigger house with nicer furniture and more expensive this and that, but the quality of life, which I keep telling my students, shouldn't be, should not come at a price tag. We all are entitled for quality of life. It's just that if you're, if you're the haves, it comes at a thousand square foot, right? And it comes with these faucets and that granite and these other things, right? But, but the quality of life, me having access to all the things that are going to support my well-being and my health and my psyche and my ability to talk to you and go here and go there and experience my city and be on its ground and its public realm, that doesn't have, is not is not a is not a condition of, of how much money I make or unable to make. And so one of the things that's a little bit different here in the United States and really visible in Los Angeles, first of all, is sort of the vast uh, area that c comprises Los Angeles and all the various uh, manners of um, natural and unnatural barriers. But one of the things that's become sort of a social economic barrier has been sort of the dissolution of common space as a, as a result of privatization. Yeah. So places that uh, were formerly available to the vast public are now uh, owned privately and uh, even uh, uh, the public private partnership, uh, once that takes place, uh, it becomes private, essentially right. excludes anyone from participating and stepping foot on ground. And so every single year, uh, the public has less and less public space. And, uh, and, and also the other thing about Los Angeles is um, sort of, a, again, it's sort of cinematic reference is that uh, we basically all perform ourselves uh, in a very real way, and you will find people actually performing their role um, as though it were scripted, uh, mm -hmm. not, not proscripted, for instance, as it would be in a caste system. Uh, people adopt the role and then perform it uh, while they uh, decide it's suitable for their, their participation. And all of this, again, on an, on an imperfect stage. Yeah. And I and I I totally agree with you, Gamboa. Even like these high-rise buildings, when they go out in the air, right, in exchange for public space, that space is for us, right? They really very skillfully design it in a way that would make all of us very, very uncomfortable to be in it. And and it's kind of like they own it, but it's definitely like the city gives it in simple terms, the city is giving it to us, so we own it as public, but then when you try to be on, the, on that permit, on these premises, you will never feel uh, like you can own this park and you have your, your space in it, right? And that's the key of public spaces and their, their existence from like the prehistoric or at least early history when it's documented the market where all of us can be is in public spaces are places that I, I feel like I own it. I, can, I have my name on it, right? That this is my place. It's my right to be there. Um, and this is why I feel a sense of relief now with the pandemic and all of us having to be outdoor that this might actually get us in touch finally with what you're saying, Gumbo, that enough is enough. Where are we inside? Why, where, where can we be outside? But now because we have to be outside, I'm hoping that like under the, the wonderful sun, sunny weather of, of LA, we realize that it actually is nicer to be outside drinking a coffee shop. That it's in, in I mean, drinking coffee and connecting with friends. It's actually nice to be walking outside and biking outside and socializing outside and 
getting in touch because once we get in touch with what we are missing, we probably are able to be to put it as a priority. Because I feel like here, and as again, I'm talking as an outsider, an immigrant who came and 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 so like everything hits me with a fresh eye. It feels like we are by we're like making a living and, and making money so that we can isolate ourselves. And that is not my experience of urban life in the Middle East. Like here, if you're wealthy, you go and buy a bigger house with bigger lands around you, and then nobody like is gonna rub shoulder, shoulder with you. Why am I buying? I wanna buy a place in my mind, in my urban mind, where it's more dense, where I'm going to see more people, where I'm going to feel like more of a member of a, of like a system, of a human being system with all its quote-unquote problems, right? Because this is what makes us real, the, the houselessness and the poverty and the um, struggles we have and the mental issues and the health issues and all of this what makes is part of the human condition and the isolated, glamorized life um, of the suburban model does not get me in touch with my with our reality as the human condition. And you know, our, like and once <clears throat> the more you get in touch with that, the more humbled you are by it. And the more understanding I feel you become to that this is part of life. That like like Hugo was saying that that houselessness is just a, like a circumstance of not having a structure that doesn't mean anything about so it doesn't mean saying anything bad about the economy. I mean, it could happen to the both of us and there is literature to say, to actually suggest that the social class you're born in, unless you really, really do well, you can get up or you really screw up and you go down. Otherwise the social class you're born in, you're pretty much are the social class you die in, right? So, um, I just, uh, to build up on what you just mentioned uh, and connecting it to Harry's uh, earlier discussion about the atomic, I mean, uh, it is not an understatement to say that people are really upset and angry in the United States and that there's like a lot of different outrages that uh, create their own sort of a, there's, there's, there, there, there's so much uh, to reflect on that, but I mean, you know, um, in, in the post-war trade-off to create, in the rush to create the atomic family and create the, the atomic architecture of like, of, of American exceptionalist so, sort of suburban architecture, you, you, you sequestered the family who used to be at the front of the house in a Porsche uh, and used to be able to enjoy Main Street USA and you send them to the back of the house and instead of the porch, you put the garage. And so now the family is in the backyard, basically like more or less sort of contained as a unit and that, that experiment basically ran from like the like the mid uh, end of the end of the 1940s all the way till today, but um, it's created like tr uh, tremendous uh, uh, behavior and psychological problems so of all sorts of things. So for example, you infantilize young young uh, kids for way longer in the American suburb than you do in other cities around the world. Like you have to wait to your 16 to get a car and then basically be able to drive out of suburbia so you could actually go have an urban experience. Whereas like in, you know, in European cities or in, in, in other cities around the world, kids when they're like 10, 12, 12 years old, they're already walking the city. So um, all of everything, you just begin compounding it. Basically like one of the main questions is, uh, has the suburb been a failure? And of course people in, in urban planning uh, the schools in the United States, they, it's a very hard question for them to basically hear it when it comes from outside of their discipline, to basically to basically introduce the discussion is, has the suburb been a failure? And at the same time, it's about land use and the way we understand its interpretation, right? And it also it's about how basically we sort of understand what does regeneration look like in a city like Los Angeles? What, what does amelioration mean in terms of climate adaptation? 
and how do you basically really implement it? Because, you know, collectivity presents a really interesting model. You all of a sudden could see basically like say the entire city of Downey, if they wanted to, they could just basically collectivize house ownership and then say, you know, we're going to change the grid in the way that we were originally organized has failed Downey and then we're going to move forward and actually create, for example, like a, a different situation where basically we're going to make more investment in verticality, more investment in community spaces, more investment in curated sort of lands, welfare landscapes, where basically we'll have a little bit more of ways to basically congregate socially in this dynamic. So uh, on, it all really has to do with basically like how ba basically these innovations around uh, uh, if you look at somebody like Frederick Olmsted, who basically was like the park designer that designed it, the central, he designed Central Park and, and many campuses throughout the United States, uh, and also uh, is responsible for the design of Lemire Park, like uh, some of the most uh, graceful experiments in creating social spaces so you could see American democracy at work, right? Uh, and, and when you are looking at these, um, uh, uh, when you're looking at these legacies for the production of American well-being, and whether it's basically immigrants uh, coming into the country and experiencing American democracy through these open spaces, these open uh, uh, private, uh, these non-private public spaces, you sort of get like a sense of basically what citizenship basically really means. But uh, when you have just had basically a developer president as that just has stepped down and 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 now we basically have uh, uh, a new uh, entity in Washington that is basically like sort of more in favor of like basically reverting back to like 2015 where basically we still had a very specific neoliberal order and the way we basically organize our economy we we don't really see that it actually is going to be an immediate uh, 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 solution to under, to rethink the way we organize our cities. If anything, it's all about continuity as 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 the way that these places sort of conceive of themselves. And this is one of the things we try to address in the exhibition. Is like in other words, like what point in the trajectory of uh, the life of a city or the the life of an idea can you interrupt into its ideal? Like the suburb is basically a not, it's, it's an ideal of how to organize American life uh, based on so many different uh, sort of gambles. But one of the things is that, it, that is happening right now is that basically it needs interventions into its idealism and or into, into its ideology mainly that would allow for basically for regenerative patterns to actually be introduced and create uh, a more sort of a, 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 a sort of fair and just equitable access to these these areas um, uh, as 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 fantastic as uh, some of the best parts of suburbia could are promising in terms of being able to find the quiet and 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 sort of like the subjectivity of basically somehow a retreat from basically the pluralist pluralist uh, noisy city um, now we're basically basically looking at that what, what's going to happen to suburbs as we as we basically, uh, for example, you, you've seen that water shortages in California remain an issue. Um, you are basically looking at a future where nobody wants to have a conversation about it. Basically, uh, is the way we've laid out laid out the sprawl over the state going to be sustainable? Like let's say in another thirty years. And this is actually became, we, this is part of the conversation as to like why we need to start thinking through that maybe the ideals that brought us here need to basically be interrogated so we could basically pr um, present uh, not alternatives but basically uh, non-ideal solutions to basically failed ideals. And so Hugo, you know, during this entire um, last year during the pandemic. Um, sort of, it's been very obvious that the disparity of wealth distribution has really um, uh, shown its face in Los Angeles with endless construction and uh, building of high rises in places that formerly did it. And uh, the whole idea of gentrification has been sort of on the fast foot, while it's uh, simultaneously uh, in the poor neighborhoods, for instance, in Boyle Heights, uh, probably one of the only places that has three crematoriums is it burning at. 24-7 uh, uh, because uh, 
the facilities for the public are incapable of dealing with uh, the mounting dead as a result of the previous uh, administration uh, uh, essentially killing off all these people by not taking care of their health um, and now polluting the air. Uh, and they've they made uh, exceptions. And, and so this, uh, this kind of environmental, physical, psychological damage is then uh, 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 kind of uh, counteracted by these beautiful gleaming new sky rises and structures that also will uh, uh, exclude anyone who actually needs a house from actually moving in and uh, is pushing more and more people away. And, uh, and, and, uh, and again, uh, this also involves uh, uh, the increase of policing, the increase of, um, of punitive behaviors and not to mention uh, rogue uh, organizations like ICE hunting people down openly uh, and, uh, and, and committing crimes against humanity, uh, putting children in cages. And so you, you kind of have sort of a, a very horrific kind of a societal environment, while at the same time, the freeways are filled with uh, cars and traffic as though there is no pandemic. Which is yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, you, yeah, I, I mean, there is basically like, there is basically a question of like that how, that uh, that people in America right now need to be able to actually feel that they need they have an equitable stake at basically at their well being and moving forward and yet at the same time um, the inability to lower the price for example for the building of affordable housing for the houseless I mean that the units themselves are costing half a million dollars is 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 basically the beginning of actually looking at why aren't we speaking about is that corruption is that a way of us understanding why does it take so much money to basically build affordable housing and at the same time uh, there is money and all the voters have basically created the money available to be able to create the first layer of, of housing in general so there's basically obviously uh, a, a very uh, deeply rooted basically misconception of basically how we use these, 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 these funds to basically ameliorate the situation. But the in California being the most progressive uh, state, and you could also argue that, I mean, you know, uh, some people, some analysts have basically bring, brought, it, brought in this question of like the Californication of the, uh, of the US presidency, right? By, by having Kamala Harris up there and, and, uh, and, and uh, a lot of people from California in the uh, current administration. Uh, okay, and if it's basically tending to actually go towards the tech sector, that's fantastic. But at the same time, you still have a chunk of America that basically is basically as like uh, Andrew Yang says uh, while he was running for president that we're a national high schoolers. And so uh, in other words, uh, there's a lot of basically like investment that needs to come down to actually retrain and rethink basically modes and labor uh, for basically the incoming generation and specifically the way we understand the design of cities. Uh, we have a shrinking uh, of, uh, sort of set of resources that are happening in Southern California that need to be approached from a, a multiple set of factors. And that the, the, the loss of, uh, the loss of uh, habitat at the same time uh, for basically being able to sort of understand, uh, for example, this, the, this dynamic that happened in the 2000s where you could just keep on thinking you could expand into the desert, you know, and forever move into that area. Um, it's going to be very difficult, very hard to continue to think that that's, that's, those actually are actual solutions for a place like Los Angeles. So to, to, to understand is that I just think that in general, Americans are at this period, if you look at the Occupy movement, if you look at the Russian uh, uh, on Washington that happened on, on January, January 6th, if you look at basically what happened to the GameStop shares recently, basically like, um, I mean, the, the plummeting value in the last two days of GameStop, it dropped by 72% uh, because basically these, the, the places where you could actually make the purchases of the GameStop have been more or less closed. Uh, at the same time, if you look at Bernie Sanders basically being put out of the uh, from running for president, but basically it was like a very it was basically like a, a, they short circuited his campaign at the beginning, and of course at the same time you look at a situation where we are now 
uh, and, and, and if we look at it just in the framework of like, okay, now this, this is what we have. We have this, this, this new administration that could actually sort of like, they're in a position that all they have to do is basically is like give COVID vaccines, give the $2,000 check, and then move into like an ameliorative, ameliorative, ameliorative sort of agenda so they could begin raise basically all these layers of renewal. Otherwise, what we are going to be seeing is that if, it, if government can't do it, certainly private initiatives are not going to do it because what, where do you create like the society to train corporations to sort of, say, for example, create the welfare that you will sort of see in the 19th century? That's, that's really to me like the, the deep uh, set of uh, contradictions here. And so we're, we're down to the last few minutes and Dina, maybe you have sort of a closing remark, um, I wonder. Um, I agree with what Hugo is raising up and uh, the issues that he's, he's, he's talking about. I think that the, the issue is not an issue of how. It's like we're not at the, at the level of, oh, let's try to figure out how can we build a house that doesn't cost half a million or astronomical, how can we afford? It's really an issue of willing, uh, will and willingness. And I'm trying to understand that there are ways to co-inhibit the play, play our cities. There are ways of other ways that are actually from a, like an outsider point of view, really feel and sound a lot more democratic than the oppressive single model um, suburban life, right? Single, 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 living some isolated tucked away yes give even it even favors my car over me that model right it gives prime location to my car and the garage where my car is gonna sleep over where am i gonna sleep it tucks me away at the back of the house so there are other ways that are going to be there are other ways we can envision our cities or we have envisioned our cities, others have envisioned our cities that really strike me as more humanistic, more, more economic, and they happen to be more affordable. So you, I guess we're, we've all very familiar with uh, sunny Los Angeles uh, and simultaneously being the apocalyptic uh, environment, uh, this kind of this simultaneity of uh, the positive and the negative and, uh, and all of this, of course, uh, exists in reality and in the mind, and, uh, but it does take action to make things move forward. And uh, we are dependent on thinkers and, and people who make things. Uh, and so I believe that the winter office and, uh, and work with um, and your ideas, uh, Dina and uh, Hugo, uh, is very important to um, introduce these ideas to the public, to think about the way they live, where they live, how they live, and how they will live, and, and how do we get past this uh, into a post-apocalypse uh, of Los Angeles, and uh, hopefully we're maybe at the beginning of this once we get past through COVID. Uh, I, I, my closing statement on this uh, is, is, is that um, LA is basically, I, 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 I find it within the framework of, of, of the velocity of changes that that the world has experienced, they're all reflected in Los Angeles in an incredible way, unlike any other city. So all the negatives that you see in Los Angeles are basically like compounded problems that you see happening in almost all of the rest of the United States. So the 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 interesting thing is that you're starting to see that the little bourgeois utopia that was Los Angeles, like say around the 1950s. It could no longer hold that sort of imagination of being basically the last place that you could come out from from the from the rest of the country and sort of like you know start fresh, try new, get a second chance. You now have all of these negations in the city. So because but they're all basically reflections of what's going on to the rest of the country. In other words, in LA you have your own you know Rust Belt. In LA you have your own sort of like biotech uh, you know so you know sort of sector. You have these extremes basically now co-joined, and the whole point is that it's not just about creating like a perfect urban plan, but it's also about basically really rethinking amelioration. Uh, and and if it if uh, if we could get basically like both the private sector and the public sector to really create a market oriented 
uh, sort of solution or community oriented solution. I don't know what is going to happen, but I don't, I'm not starting from a place of pessimism. I'm just introducing that our exhibition was just the beginning of producing what would the non-ideal solution look like mm -hmm. to basically uh, get away from alternatives. Well, that's, that's a really great way to end. And uh, I wanna thank you, um, Dina and Hugo for joining us today for uh, the Armory and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you all for joining us today at the Armory. Harry, that was um, incredible facilitation. Hugo and Dina, your observations um, were very rich, gave us a lot to think about. And I just wanna thank all of you for this um, conversation that springboards from the ideas that we explored in the Winter Office exhibition at the Armory in 2019. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good Have a good day. Day. And Dina and Hugo. Okay. Ciao. Yeah. Have a good night. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.